Hello, this is Maysam Safari. I'm sitting for Canadian Security Certificate exam. As part of exam preparation, I'm reading the Canadian Securities course textbooks published by the Canadian Securities Institute. I'm recording every chapter I read separately and will publish them for my personal accountability and public benefit. Hope you find it useful. If so, please subscribe to receive next chapters. Thanks. Chapter 10 Derivatives In this chapter, you will learn all about derivatives, what they are, what their underlying assets consist of, and who use them. You will also learn about the different categories of derivatives, including options, forwards, and future contracts. Finally, you will learn about the rights and warrants by which investors benefit from the underlying stock on which derivatives are based. Learning Objectives 1. Explain the difference between over-the-counter and exchange-traded derivatives. 2. Identify the types of underlying assets on which derivatives are based. 3. Describe how the various market participants use derivatives. 4. Describe call and put option positions and the option strategies used by the market participant. 5. Distinguish between forward and future contracts and the strategies used by market participants. 6. Distinguish between the features, benefits and intrinsic value of rights and warrants. Introduction. In the past two decades, we have witnessed phenomenal growth in the creation and use of various derivative instruments. The source of this growth, to a large extent, has been due to the increase in the volatility of interest rates, exchange rates, and commodity prices, financial deregulation, advances in information technology, and breakthrough in financial engineering have also contributed to the growth. Depending on the position taken, derivatives can act as substitute for underlying asset, act as an offset to an existing position in the underlying asset, make it possible to enhance overall portfolio returns and to hedge or reduce exposure to different sources of risk. Derivatives are not assets like stocks and bonds. Their value is derived from the underlying asset such as a financial security or a commodity. Institutional investors and portfolio managers rely on derivatives and consider them sensible investment that can enhance return and protect against the inherent risk in the market. For many investors, however, particularly smaller retail investors, derivatives are considered risky, complex instruments. This viewpoint can be attributed to the fact that derivatives are a specialized financial instruments created by market participants. Certainly, the frenzy trading that the financial press often report about oil and gas futures, foreign currencies, pork bellies, and gold does sound exciting. We have all heard stories about a commodity traders somewhere in the world betting the right way on a position in natural gas, for example, and making a fortune. Clearly, derivatives can be used in a variety of steps as widely speculative or rigorously conservative investment vehicles and in strategies that fall between the two extremes. This chapter focuses on the building blocks of derivatives. The key to understanding these product is to become comfortable with the terminology and to understand the contractual obligations being assumed and the types of strategy being per pursued. The role of derivatives. Learning objective one, explain the difference between over-the-counter and exchange traded derivatives. A derivative is a financial contract between two parties whose value is derived from or dependent on the value of an underlying asset. The underlying asset can be a financial asset such as a stock or bond, a currency, a future contract, an index, or even an interest rate. It can also be a real asset or commodity such as crude oil, gold, or wheat. 
because of the link between the value of a of a derivative and its underlying asset derivatives can act as a substitute for or as an offset to a position held in the underlying asset as such derivatives are often used to manage the risk of an existing or anticipated position in the underlying asset they are also used to speculate on the value of the underlying asset some derivatives have more complex structures than others but they all fall into one of two basic types options and forwards both types are contracts between two parties a buyer and a seller the buyer in an option contract has the right but not the obligation to buy or sell a specified quantity of the underlying asset in the future at a price agreed upon today the seller of the option is obliged to complete the transaction if called upon to do so an option that gives its owner the right to buy the underlying asset is a call option one that gives the right to this to sell the underlying asset is a put option with forward contracts both parties oblige themselves to trade the underlying asset in the future at a price agreed upon neither party has given the other any right they are both obliged to participate in the future trade despite this fundamental difference between options and forward the two type of derivatives have shared features features common to all derivatives all derivatives have the following features common there are contractual agreements between two parties often called counterparties a buyer and a seller the agreement spell out the rights if any and the obligation of each party they have a price upon which the buyer and seller must agree buyers try to buy them for as little as possible whereas sellers try to sell them for as much as possible they have an expiration date both parties must fulfill their obligation or exercise their rights under the contract on or before the expiration date after that date the contract is automatically terminated when a derivative contract is drawn up it includes a price a formula for determining the price of an asset to be bought and sold in the future either on or before the expiration date with forwards no upfront payment is required sometimes one or both parties make a performance bond or good faith deposit which gives the party on the other side of the transaction a higher level of assurance that the term of the forward will be honored with options the buyer makes a payment to the seller when the contract is drawn up this payment known as the premium gives the buyer the right to buy or sell the underlying asset at the preset price on or before the expiration date another feature of derivative is that unlike financial assets such as stock or bonds they are considered a zero-sum game aside from commission fees and other transaction costs the gain from an option or forward contract by one part counterparty is exactly offset by the loss to the other counterparty in other words every dollar gained by one party represent a dollar lost by the counterparty derivative markets as we discussed in previous chapters most bonds trade in the over-the-counter or otc market but the stocks and derivatives trade both in the otc market and in organized exchanges the primary difference between exchange traded and OTC stocks and bond is trading mechanics but the difference between exchange traded and OTC derivative is much more pronounced over-the-counter derivatives the OTC derivative market is an active and vibrant market that consists of loosely connected and highly regulated network of dealers who negotiate transactions directly with one another. Negotiations take place primarily over the telephone or through computer terminals. The OTC market is dominated by financial institutions such as banks and investment dealers that trade with their large corporate clients 
and other financial institutions. This market has no trading floor and no regular trading hours. Some traders and support staff work at their trading desks at night and during weekends and holidays. One of the attractive features of OTC derivative to the corporation and institutional investors that use them is that contracts can be custom designed to meet a specific need. As a result, OTC derivatives tend to be somewhat more complex than exchange traded derivatives because special features can be added to the basic properties of options and forwards. Exchange Traded Derivatives A derivative exchange is a legal corporate entity organized for the trading of derivative contracts. The exchange provides the facilities for trading either a trading floor or an electronic trading system, in some cases both. The exchange also stipulates the rules and regulation governing trading in order to maintain fairness, order, and transparency in the marketplace. Derivative exchanges evolved in response to OTC issues, including concerns around standardization, liquidity, and default risk. Canada has one derivative exchange, the Montreal Exchange, or Bourse of the Montreal, lists options on stocks indexes, and U.S. currency, as well as exchange-traded forwards, or futures on bonds, bank acceptances, and indexes. Exchange traded versus over the counter derivatives. You may wonder how organized exchanges and OTC markets successfully coexist when the interest that underlying derivatives instruments in both markets are basically the same. Over time, it seems logical that one of the two markets would prevail. The coexistence has proven successful and long-lasting because the two markets differ in significant ways. Each market offers advantages depending on the particular need of the user. A standardization and flexibility. One of the most important differences between exchange-traded and OTC derivatives is flexibility. In the OTC market, the terms and conditions of a contract can be tailored for specific users who may choose the most appropriate terms to meet their particular need. In contrast, for exchange-traded derivatives, the exchange specifies the contracts that are available to be traded. Each contract has standardized terms and other specifications, which may or may not meet the needs of certain derivative users. Privacy. Another important difference is the private nature of the OTC derivative. In an OTC derivative transaction, neither the general public nor others, including competitors, know about the transaction. On exchanges, all transactions are recorded and known to the general public. However, the exchanges do not announce, nor do they necessarily know, the identities of the ultimate counterparties to every transaction. Liquidity and offsetting. Because they are private and custom design, OTC derivatives cannot be easily terminated or transferred to other parties in a secondary market. In many cases, these contracts can only be terminated through negotiation between the two parties. By contrast, the standardized and public nature of exchange-traded derivatives mean that they can be terminated easily by taking an offsetting position in the contract. Did you know, to offset a position means to close the position by taking the exact opposite position in the contract. For example, if you buy a call option on XYZ, you would offset the position by selling a call option on the XYZ with exactly the same features. Default risk. Another downside to the private nature of OTC derivative is that default risk, also called credit risk, is a major concern. Default risk is the risk that one of the parties to a derivative contract will not be able to meet its obligation to the other party. Given this risk, many derivative dealers in the OTC market do not deal with customers that are unable to establish a certain level of credit worthiness. In addition, the size of most contracts in the OTC market may be greater than most investors can manage. For this reason, 
The OTC market is restricted to large institutional and corporate customers. Individual investors are generally limited to dealing in exchange traded derivatives. Default risk is not a significant concern with exchange traded derivatives. Clearing houses, which are set up by exchanges to ensure that market operates efficiently, guarantee the financial obligations of every party and contract. The clearing corporation becomes, in effect, the buyer of every seller and the seller of for every buyer. The Canadian Derivative Clearing Corporation, or CDCC, is responsible for clearing Montreal exchange future and option trades. Regulation because exchange-traded contracts are public, whereas OTC contracts are private, derivative transactions on exchange are extensively regulated by the exchange themselves and by government agencies, whereas OTC derivative transactions are generally unregulated. On one hand, the regulated environment of exchange-traded derivatives bring about fairness, transparency, and an efficient secondary market. On the other hand, the largely unregulated environment in the OTC markets permits unrestricted and explosive growth in financial innovation and engineering. Generally, no government approval is needed to offer a new type of OTC derivatives. The innovative contracts are simply created by parties that see mutual gains in doing business with each other. The transactions are not bound by costly constraints or bureaucratic red tapes. Summary comparison of exchange traded and over-the-counter derivatives. Table 10.1 summarizes the differences between exchange traded and OTC derivatives. Table 10.1 Exchange traded and over-the-counter derivatives. Exchange traded, traded on an exchange, a standardized contract, transparent or public, easy termination prior to contract expiry, clearing house act as third party guarantor ensuring contracts performance to both trading parties, performance bond required depending on the type of derivative, gain and losses accrue on a day to day basis or marking to market, heavily regulated, delivery rarely takes place, commission visible, used by retail investors, corporations, and institutional investors. Over-the-counter, traded largely through computer and or phone lines, terms of the contract agreed to between buyer and seller, private, early termination more difficult, no third party guarantor, performance bond not required in most cases, gains and losses generally settled at the end of the contract rather than marking to market, much less regulated, delivery to final cash settlement usually occurring, fee usually built into price, used by corporation and financial institutions. Types of underlying assets. Learning Objective 2. Identify the types of underlying assets on which derivatives are based. The two general categories of underlying assets for derivative contracts are commodities and financial asset. The asset that underlie derivatives contracts traded on or organized exchanges in the United States and Canada are detailed below. In the OTC markets, the choice of underlying asset is limited only by the imagination and needs of market participants. Commodities. Commodity futures and options are commonly used by producers, merchandisers, and processors of commodities to protect themselves against the fluctuating commodity prices. Speculators also use commodities to profit from the fluctuating prices, depending on the commodity prices are affected by supply and demand, agricultural production, weather, government policies, international trade, demographic trends, and economic and political conditions. Commodities that underlie derivatives contracts include the following types, grain and oil seeds, like wheat, corn, soybeans, and canola, livestock and meat, like pork bellies, hogs, live cattle, and feeder cattle, forest fiber and food, 
like lumber, cotton, orange juice, sugar, cocoa, and coffee. Precious and industrial metals like gold, silver, platinum, copper, and aluminum. Energy products like crude oil, heating oil, gasoline, natural gas, and propane. Most of these commodities, such as soybean, crude oil, and copper, are purchased to be consumed. Others, such as gold and silver, are used primarily for investment purposes. Other than the energy category, most commodity derivatives are exchange-traded contracts. Financial assets. In recent decades, we have witnessed an explosive growth in derivatives, especially in financial derivatives. This growth has been fueled by the following forces, increasingly volatile interest rate, exchange rate, and volatility prices, financial deregulation and intensified competition among financial institutions, globalization of trades, and tremendous advances in information technology, extraordinary theoretical breakthrough in financial engineering. The most commonly used financial derivatives are summarized below. Equities. Equity is the underlying asset of a large category of financial derivatives. The predominant equity derivatives are equity options or options on individual stocks. These derivatives are traded mainly on organized exchanges such as Montreal Exchange, the Chicago Board Option Exchange, and the International Securities Exchange, the Boston Option Exchange, the NYSE Amex option, Options, and NYSE ARCA Options Market. Interest rates. Exchange traded interest rate derivatives are generally based on interest rate sensitive securities rather than on interest rates directly. In Canada, underlying assets include bankers' acceptance and Government of Canada bonds. All interest rate futures trading in Canada take place at the Montreal Exchange. In the OTC market, interest rate derivatives are generally based on well-defined and well-known floating interest rates. Examples of such underlying rates include the yields on the Treasury bills and Treasury bonds and the London Interbank Offer Rate, which is the interest earned on Euro-Dollar deposit in London. Because these OTC derivatives are based on an interest rate rather than on actual security, the contracts are settled in cash. Currencies. The most commonly used underlying asset in currency derivatives are the US dollar, British pound, Japanese yen, Swiss franc, and European euro. The types of contracts traded include currency futures and options on organized exchange and currency forwards and currency swaps in the OTC market. Did you know a swap is a private contractual agreement between two parties used to exchange swap periodic payments in the future based on the agreed formula. Swaps are essentially equivalent to a series of forward contracts packaged together. The concept swap is explained more fully in Derivatives Fundamental Course DFC. The Users of Derivatives Learning Objective 3 Describe how the various market participants use derivatives. Derivative users can be divided into four groups. Individual investors, institutional investors, business and corporations, and derivative dealers. The first three groups are the end users of derivatives. They use derivatives either to speculate on the price or value of an underlying asset or to protect the value of an anticipated or existing position in the underlying asset. The latter application, a form of risk management, is known as hedging. The last group, derivative dealers, are the intermediaries in the market who buy and sell to meet the demands of the end users. Derivatives dealers do not normally take large position in derivatives contracts, Rather, they try to balance the risk and earn profit from the volume of deals they arrange with their customers. Individual investors. For the most part, the individual investors are able to trade exchange-traded derivatives only. They are active investors in exchange-traded options, market, and to a lesser extent, future markets. 
Individual investors should use derivative only if they fully understand all of the risk and potential rewards. They should also consider speculative strategies only if they have a high degree of risk tolerance and risk capacity because of the potential to suffer large losses in derivative trading. Risk management strategies, on the other hand, can be beneficial to all investors from the most conservative to the most aggressive. Individual investors in Canada can trade exchange traded derivative directly by opening a special type of account with a full service or self-directed brokerage firm registered to offer such accounts. To deal with investors in exchange traded derivative investment advisors at full service firms and investment representative as self-directed firms must be properly licensed. Institutional investors. Institutional investors that use derivatives include mutual fund managers, hedge fund managers, pension fund managers, and insurance companies, among others. Like individual investors, institutional investors use derivative for both speculation and risk management. In contrast to individual, most institutional investors are able to trade OTC derivatives in addition to exchange traded derivatives. From a risk management perspective, hedging is the attempt to eliminate or reduce the risk of either holding an asset for future sale or anticipating a future purchase of an asset. Hedging with derivatives involves taking a position in a derivative with a payoff that is opposite to that of the asset to be hedged. For example, if a hedger owns an asset and is concerned that the price of the asset could fall in the future, a short derivative position in the asset would be appropriate. A decline in the price of the asset will result in loss on the asset being held, but would be offset by a profit on the derivative contract. In general, speculation is inconsistent with objective of risk management because it increases risk instead of reducing it. Specifically, speculation involves a future focus, the formulation of expectation, and the willingness to take position in order to profit. In other words, speculators bet on the direction of the market and take position according to profit from a certain predicted movement of the market. Other common investment strategies using derivatives include market entry and exit, arbitrage and yield enhancement as explained below. Market entry and exit. Quickly exiting and entering a market in the conventional way by buying and selling the actual stock can be inefficient and more costly than expected. The costs associated with trading include commission fees, bid ask spread, and other administrative fees. These costs can be high in some cases, may affect the decision to enter or exit a market. In addition, buying or selling a large quantity of certain securities can produce adverse price pressure on the market. A large sell order may push the price down, whereas a large buy order may bid up the price. These adverse prices affect which are hidden costs to the transaction can be especially severe in thinly traded equity or bond markets, that is, markets for illiquid securities. It is usually more efficient and cost-effective to carry out temporary changes to the portfolio using derivatives rather than trading in the underlying asset directly. For example, the manager of a global equity fund may want to temporarily change the composition of her portfolio by moving out of British stocks and into French and German stocks for only a few months. To do so, she could sell British index contracts and buy French and German index contracts. When market conditions subsequently change, a reverse of these contracts would bring the portfolio back to its original composition. Arbitrage. An arbitrage opportunity refers to a scenario where the same asset or commodity is traded at different prices in two separate markets. By purchasing low in one market and selling a high in the other market simultaneously, an investor locks in a fixed amount of profit at no risk. 
For example, suppose an arbitrator spot an exploitable market mispricing and attempts to profit by buying in the cheap market and selling in the rich market. If the two transactions are executed simultaneously or nearly simultaneously, then there is no investment or risk involved in the arbitrage. Yield enhancement. Yield enhancement is a method of boosting returns on an underlying investment portfolio by taking a speculative position based on expectation of future market movements. The most popular way to enhance an investment yield is by selling options against the position. Corporations and businesses. Corporations of all types and sizes use derivatives. For the most part, However, users tend to be larger companies that make use of borrowed money, have multinational corporations that generate or require foreign currencies, or produce or consume significant amounts of one or more commodities. Corporations and businesses use derivatives primarily for hedging purposes. In particular, they tend to focus on derivatives that help them hedge interest rates, currency, and commodity price risk. Corporations that hedge with derivatives do so because, rather than focusing on these risks, they prefer to direct their efforts toward running their primary business. On the other hand, a company that anticipates buying an asset in the future may be concerned that the price could rise before the purchase is made, hedging risk by buying a forward contract or a call option is appropriate in this case. A price increase will result in the hedger paying a higher price, but this cost will be offset by a profit in the forward or call option. A hedger will start with a pre-existing risk that is generated from a normal course of business. For example, a farmer growing wheat has a pre-existing risk that the price of wheat will decline by the time it is harvested and ready to be sold. In the same way, an oil refiner that holds storage tanks of crude oil waiting to be refined has a pre-existing risk that the price of the refined product may decline in the interim. To reduce or eliminate these price risks, the farmer and the refiner could take short derivative position that will profit if the price of their assets decline. Any losses in the underlying asset will be offset by gaining in the derivatives instruments. That being said, any gains in these assets would be offset by derivatives losses of roughly the same size, depending on the type of derivatives chosen and the overall effectiveness of the hedge. Derivative strategies were once little used and poorly understood by corporations, but they have increasingly become an important corporate level concern. It is now expected that a company's board of directors will use derivatives in an appropriate fashion as a risk management tool. Although it may seem like a simple decision determining whether or not to hedge and how to hedge can be a complex process. Hedging is not always the right choice, nor does it always result in the complete elimination of all risk. Derivative Dealers Dealers in the exchange traded market take the form of market makers that stand ready to buy or sell contracts at any time. Exchange traded market makers include banks, investment dealers, and professional individuals. Derivative dealers play a crucial role in the OTC market by taking the other side of the position interested into buy and uses. In Canada, the primary OTC derivative dealers are the chartered banks and their investment dealers subsidiaries, as well as the Canadian subsidiaries of large foreign bank and investment dealers. Options. Learning Objective 4. Describe call and put option position and option strategies used by market participants. An option is a contract between two parties, a buyer known as the long position or holder and a seller known as the short position or the writer. This contract gives certain rights and or obligation to buy or sell a specified amount of an underlying asset 
at a specified price within a specified time. The buyer of the option has the right but not the obligation to exercise the terms of the contract, whereas the seller is obliged to fulfill his or her part of the contract if called upon to do so. An option that gives its holder the right to buy and the seller the obligation to sell the underlying asset is known as a call option. An option that gives the holder the right to sell and its writer the obligation to buy the underlying asset is referred to as a put option. Table 10.2 describes the four basic option position and illustrates in each position whether the investor expects the price of the underlying asset to rise or fall. Table 10.2, the four basic option positions. Call option, holder or long position pays premium to the writer, has the right to buy the underlying asset at the predetermined price, expect the, expect the price of underlying asset to rise. Writer or the short position receives premium from the buyer has the obligation to sell the underlying asset at the predetermined price if called upon to do so, expect the price of the underlying asset to remain the same or fall. Put option pays the holder or long position pays premium to the writer, has the right to sell the underlying asset at the predetermined price, or the holder expect the price of the underlying asset to fall. For a put option, the writer receives premium from the buyer. Writer has the obligation to buy the underlying asset at the predetermined price if called upon to do so, and the writer expect the price of the underlying asset to remain the same or rise. When traders and investors discuss option, they usually describe the specific option they are talking about by quickly summarizing the option's most salient features in one phrase. They generally use the following syntax. Number of options, contracts, underlying asset, expression months, strike price, option type. Example, an investor wants to buy 10 exchange traded call option on XYZ stocks with an expiration date in December and a strike price of $50. The investor states, I want to buy 10 XYZ December 50 calls. Just as he would if he were buying a stock, the investor also indicates the price he is willing to pay. He can buy the options as market with in which case he agrees to accept the best price currently available or he can enter a limit order by specifying the highest price he is willing to pay. Option terminology. The following different terms include common phrases used when discussing option. The strike price. The strike price or exercise price is the price at which the underlying asset can be purchased or sold in the future. The buyer and the seller agree on this future price when they enter into the option contract. Option premium. To obtain the right to buy or sell the underlying asset, option buyers must pay the seller a fee known as the option price or option premium. Once the premium has been paid, the option buyer has no further obligation to the writer unless the buyer decides to exercise the option. Therefore, the most that the buyer of an option can lose is the premium paid. On the other hand, writers of options must always stand ready to fulfill their obligation to pay or sell the underlying asset. Expiration date. Exchange traded options expire at a specific and pre-established date. For example, the expiration months for a series of options on ABC stock may be January, April, July, and October. This means that there are four different sets of options for ABC stock, each of which expires in a different month. Typically, the day that the option expires is the third Friday of the expiration months. Traditionally, options are listed with relatively short terms of 9 months or less to expiration. 
Exchange have also introduced weekly options for some indexes and equities. Weekly options are listed for trading at the open on Thursday. With expression dates on any of the five Fridays following the listing week. Weekly options provide investors with more targets trading opportunities, such as taking advantage of earning release, government reports, and central banks, interest rate policies announcement. Trading units. An option trading unit describes the size or amount of the underlying asset represented by an option contract. For example, the exchange traded stock option in North America have a standard trading unit of 100 shares. Therefore, the holder of one call option has the right to buy 100 shares of the underlying stock, while the holder of one put option has the right to sell 100 shares. Options on other underlying assets have a variety of trading units. The premium of an option is always quoted on a per unit basis which means that the premium quote for a stock option is the premium for each share of the underlying stock to calculate the total premium for a contract multiply the premium quote by the options trading unit for example if a stock option is quoted with a premium of one dollar it will cost the buyer one hundred dollar for each contract American style options. American style options can be exercised at any time up to and including the expiration date. All exchange traded stock options in North America are American style options. European style options. European style options can be exercised only on the expiration date. Most index options are European style options. Long term equity anticipation securities. A long-term equity anticipation security is a simply a long-term option contract offering the same risk and reward as a regular option. Opening transaction An opening transaction occurs when an investor establishes a new position in an option contract. An opening buy transaction results in a long position in the option, whereas an opening sell transaction results in a short position in the option. On or before an option's expiration date, one of three things will happen to all long and short positions. 1. The position will be offset. Position may be liquidated prior to expiration by way of an offsetting transaction, which in effect cancels the position. Offsetting a pos long position involves selling the same type and number of contracts offsetting a short position involves buying the same type and number of contracts unless they are specifically designed to be transferable otc options can only be offset through negotiations between the long and short parties exchange traded options however can be offset simply by entering an offsetting order on the exchange on which the option trades Two, the party holding the long position will exercise the option. When this happens, the party holding the short position is said to be assigned on the option. For the owner of call option, the act of exercising involves buying the underlying asset from the assigned call writer at a price equal to the strike price. For the owner of the put option, the act of exercising involves selling the underlying asset to assign put writer at the price equal to the strike price. 3. The party holding the long position will let the option expire as worthless. Buyers of options have right not obligations. They do not have to exercise an option before it expires if it is not in their best interest to do so. They can allow it to expire instead. In such cases, the option buyer loses money with the premium paid and the option writer makes money with the premium received. In the money, the owners of option will exercise only if it is in their best financial interest, which can only occur when an option is in the money. A call option is in the money when the price of the underlying asset is higher than the strike price. If this is the case, the call option holder 
can exercise the right to buy the underlying asset at the strike price and then turn around and sell it at a higher market price. A put option is in the money when the price of the underlying asset is lower than the strike price. If this is the case, the put option holder can exercise the right to sell the underlying asset at the higher strike price, which would create a short position and then cover the short position at the lower market price. Out of the money and at the money. Owner of options will definitely not exercise if they are out of the money or at the money. A call option is out of the money when the price of the underlying asset is lower than the strike price. A put option is out of the money when the price of the underlying asset is higher than the strike price. Call and put options are at the money when the price of the underlying asset equals the strike price. In either cases, it is not in the financial best interest of the option holder to exercise. If a call option is out of the money, it does not make financial sense to the for the call option holder to buy the underlying asset at the strike price by exercising the call when it can be purchased at the lower price in the market. Similarly, a put option is out of the money. It does not make financial sense for the put option holder to sell the underlying asset at the strike price by exercising the put when it can be sold at a higher price in the market because there is generally no advantage in exercising at the money option for which the strike price equals the market price of the underlying asset at the money options are normally left to expire worthless. Intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is the value of certainty. The in the money portion of a call or put option is referred to as the option's intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is calculated using the following formula. Intrinsic value of an in the money call option is the price of underlying minus strike price. Intrinsic value of an in the money put option is the strike price minus price of underlying. For example, if XYZ stock is trading at $60, a call option on XYZ stock with a strike price of $55 has $5 of intrinsic value, calculated as $60 minus $55 equals to $5. Similarly, a put option in on XYZ with a strike price of $65 has $5 intrinsic value, calculated as $65 minus $60 equals $5. If an option is not in the money, it has zero intrinsic value. For example, a call option on XYZ with a $65 strike price has no intrinsic value when XYZ is trading at $60 as does a put option with a strike price of $55. Intrinsic value is a relatively easy concept to understand. It is the amount that the owner of the an in the money option would earn by immediately exercising the option and offsetting any resulting position in the underlying asset. Time value. Time value is a more subtle concept than intrinsic value. Simply put, the time value represents the value of uncertainty. Option buyers want options to be in the money at expression. Option writers want the reverse. The greater the uncertainty about where the option will be at expression, either in the money or out of the money, the greater the option's time value. Prior to the expiration date, most options trade for more than their intrinsic value. The option's time value is the amount that an option is trading above its intrinsic value. It is calculated using the following formula of option price minus option's intrinsic value equals time value of an option. For example, if a call option on XYZ with a strike price of $55 is trading for $6 when XYZ stock is trading at $60, the option has $1 of time value calculated as follows. $6 minus $60 minus $55 
equals to one dollar you can rearrange the equation for the time value of an option to find that the price of any option is simply the sum of its intrinsic value and its time value option exchanges in Canada, the Montreal Exchange lists option on individual stock, stock indexes, financial futures, exchange-traded funds or ETFs, and the US dollar. Just like the stock, exchange-traded options, prices, and trading information are reported on the exchange website by financial data providers and in the business press the next day. Table 10.3 provides an illustration. Table 10.3, Equity Option Quotation. XYZ Inc. 1775 Bid, Ask, Last, Option Volume, Option Interest or March 1750 Bid 3.80 Ask 4.05 Last 3.95 Option Volume 50 Option Interest 1595 1750 P 2.35 Ask 260, last 240, option volume 5, interest 3301, September 1750, bid 1.1, ask 135, last 125, volume 41, interest 3403. 1750 put bid 95 cent ask 1.05 last one volume 30 interest 1058 december 20 put bid 185 ask two last 1.9 volume 193 option interest 1047 total Option volume 319. Option interest 10,404. Explanation XYZ Inc. This is the underlying for the option. 1775. This number represents the last sales price of the underlying. March is the option's expression months. March, September, December. $17.50. This number represents the strike and the exercise price of each series. $17.50p. The P indicates that the option is a put. 2.80. Bid. This number represents the latest bid price for each XYZ option expressed as a per share price. 4.05. Ask. This number represents the latest ask price for each XYZ option expressed as a per share price. 2.9 last. This number represents the last sales price, last premium traded of an option contract expressed as a per share price. For example, the 3.95 figure for the XYZ March 1750 calls is the last sales price for this series. Option volume. This is the number of options traded. 50 plus 5 plus 41 plus 30 plus 193 equals to 319. For example, 50 XYZ March 17.5 calls were traded in the trading session shown, representing 5,000 underlying XYZ, calculated as 50 times 100. Opt interest. This is the open interest. This is the total number of option contracts in the series that are currently outstanding and have not been closed out or exercised. For example, the figure 1595 referred to the open interest for the XYZ March 1750 calls. The figure 10404 refers to the open interest of all series of XYZ options, including the series that did trade as well as the series that did not trade. Option strategies for individual and institutional investors. The range and complexity of options trading strategies are practically limitless. 
However, we will examine eight option strategies commonly used by individual and institutional investors. Each strategy is either a speculative or risk management strategy, and each is based on exchange traded options on the shares of the fictitious company XYZ Inc. Note, these strategies and the majority of the results are equally applicable to options on any underlying asset. For all of the strategies presented below, assume that we are currently in the months of June and that XYZ Inc. stock is trading at $52.50 per share. The discussion that follow make use of one of the four options listed in Table 10.4. Table 10.4, four options on XYZ Inc. stock trading at 52.50. Option type, call. Expiration September, strike price 50, premium 4.55 dollar. Option type call, expiration December, a strike price of 55 dollar, premium 2 dollar. Option type put, expiration September, a strike price 50 dollar, premium 1.5 dollar. Option type put, expiration December, a strike price 55 dollar, premium 4.85. Note, to keep things simple, commissions, margin requirements, and dividends are ignored in all of the examples in this chapter. Buying call options. Investors buy call options with either of two investment strategies in mind, to speculate in the hope of earning a profit or to manage risk. The most popular reason for buying call is to profit from an expected increase in the price of the underlying stock. The buyer profits by investing only a fraction of the amount required to buy the stock. This speculative strategy relies on the fact that call option price tend to rise as the price of the stock rises. The challenge with this strategy is to select the appropriate expiration date and strike price to generate the maximum profit given the expected increase in the price of the stock. There are two ways that investors can realize profit on call options when they underlying increase in price. They can exercise the option and buy the stock at the lower exercise price or they can sell the option directly into the market at a profit. Calls are also bought to establish a maximum purchase price for the stock or to limit the optional loss on a short position in the stock. In this sense, options act much like insurance by protecting the buyer when the stock price moves higher. These strategies are considered risk management strategies. The exchange that follows illustrates the two type of call option strategies. Example, refer to table 10.4 for figures presented in the following strategy. Strategy, buying calls to speculate. Assume that an investor buys 5XYZ December 55 call option at the current price of $2. We break down this as purchase to its individual part as follows. 5. The number of contracts. Each contract worth 100 shares. XYZ, the underlying stock on which the call option is based. December, the expiration date, 55. The stock price, $2 the premium or cost to purchase the call option. In this example, the holder or the investor pay a premium of $1,000 calculated as 2 times 100 shares times 5 contract to obtain the right to buy 500 shares of XYZ Inc. at $55 per share on or before the December expiration because the options are out of the money or the strike price is greater than the stock price of $52.50, the $2 premium consists entirely of time value. The option have no intrinsic value. If the holder is a speculator, the intent of this call purchase is to profit from the expectation of a higher XYZ stock price. He probably has no intention to actually owning 500 shares of XYZ. Rather, he will want to sell the 5XYZ December 55 calls before they expire, preferably at a higher price than 
what he paid for them. His chances of success depends on many factors, most importantly the price of XYZ shares. If the price of XYZ shares rises, the price of the calls will likely rise and the holder will be able to sell them at a profit. Of course, he faces the risk that the stock price will not rise or worse will fall. If the price does fall, the price of the calls will likely fall as well. In that case, he may be forced to sell them at a loss. For example, if by September the price of XYZ stock is $60, the XYZ December 55 call will be trading for at least their intrinsic value, which is in this case $5. Because there are still three months remaining before the option expires, the premium will also include some time value. Assuming that the call have $1.7 of time value, they will be traded at $6.7. Therefore, the holder could choose to sell the options at $6.7 and realize a profit of 4.7 per share equal to the difference between the current premium of $6.7 minus the premium paid $2 or 2350 in total calculated as 4.7 times 100 shares times 5 contract. If however XYZ shares are trading at $45 per share in September the XYZ December 55 call might be worth only 25 cents at the the time value of 25 cent is an assumption made as part of the example. At this time, and indeed at all other times before expiration, the holder will have to decide whether to sell the option or hold them in the hope that the stock price and the options price recovers. If he decides to sell at this time, he will incur a loss equal to $1.75 per share, calculated as $2 minus 25 cents, or 875 cents in total, calculated as $1.75 times 100 shares times 5 contracts. The decision to sell prior to expiration of a call option is not easy. On one hand, selling before expiration allows the holder to earn any time value that remain built into the option premium. On the other hand, the option holder give up the chance of reaping any further increase in the option's intrinsic value. The call holder's outlook of the price of the stock obviously plays a crucial role in this decision. An attractive feature of a speculative call option strategy is the potential to achieve larger profits on a percentage basis through leverage. Conversely, of course, by buying call options instead of buying the stock directly, the investor is also at risk of greater losses. Example, refer to table 10.4 for figures presented in the following strategy. A strategy, buying calls to speculate. Continued. Assume that the price of XYZ Inc. stock rises to $60 in September. If the call holder sells the XYZ December 55 calls for a profit of 4.7, the rate of return on the investment based on the initial cost of $2 is 235%, calculated as follow. 4.7 divided by 2 times 100 is 235%. If the stock price declined to $45, however, and the call buyer sells the option for a loss of $1.75 and the rate of return is negative 87.5% calculated as follow. Negative $1.75 divided by $2 times 100 is negative 87.5%. To see how leveraging increased both profit and loss on a percentage basis, compare these returns to the returns from simply buying the stock at $52.5. If the stock is sold at $60 for a profit of 7.5 per share, the return is 14.3%, calculated as follow, $7.5 divided by 52.5 
times 100 is 14.3 percent if the stock falls to 45 dollar and the loss is 7.5 dollar per share the rate of return is negative 14.3 percent calculate as follow negative 7.5 dollar divided by 52.5 times 100 is negative 14.3 percent from this example, we can see that the call provided a greater rate of return when the stock price increased, but a lower rate of return when the stock price fell. This potential loss is the risk faced by all investors who use leverage when they buy call options. The other reason that investors buy call options is to mitigate risk. Example, refer to table 10.4 for figures presented in the following strategy. A strategy, buying calls to manage risk. Assume that the fund manager intends to buy 50,000 shares of XYZ stock, but will not receive the funds until December. Buying 500 XYZ December 54 call options will protect the fund managers from any sharp increase in the price of XYZ above the $55 strike price by establishing a maximum price at which the shares can be purchased. For example, if XYZ share increases to $60 just prior to the expiration date in December, the options will trade for their intrinsic value only. In this case, $5 calculated as $60 minus $55 because the call buyer now has the money to buy the shares she can exercise the call at which point she will purchase 50,000 shares of XYZ at the strike price of $55 because the options originally cost $2 the call buyer's net purchase price is actually $57 per share if however XYZ shares are trading at $45 just prior to the expiration date, she will let the option expire and will buy the shares at the going price of $45 each. Her effective cost is $47, which includes the $2 paid for the calls. Call options can also be used to manage risk by protecting short sales. Let's assume that the investor sells 500 shares of XYZ stock at its current price of $52.5 but wants to limit the loss in case the stock price rises. By buying 5 XYZ December 55 call options, she protects her investment from any sharp increase in the price of XYZ above the 55 strike price because the call establishes a maximum price at which the shares can be purchased back. For example, if XYZ share increases to $60 just prior to the expiration date in December, the options will be trading for their intrinsic value only, which in this case is $5, calculated as $60 minus $55. The investor exercises the calls and purchases 500 shares of XYZ at a strike price of $55 because the option originally cost $2 her net purchase price is actually $57 per share and because she sold the stock short at $52.5 and bought it back at $57, her loss is limited to $4.5 per share. If, however, XYZ are trading at $45 just prior to the expiration date, the investor will let the options expire and will buy the shares at the market price of $45 per share. Her effective purchase price is $47, which includes the $2 paid for the calls. In this case, her profit is $5.5 on the short sales. Or sell at $52.5, buy back at $47 to close the position. Writing call options. Investors write call options primarily for the income they provide in the form of the premium. The income is the writers to keep no matter what happens to the price of the underlying asset or what the buyer eventually does. Call writing strategies are primarily speculative in nature, but they can be used to manage risk as well. 
call option writers can be classified as either covered call writers or naked call writers covered call writers own the underlying stock and use this position to meet the obligations if they are assigned naked call writers do not own the underlying stock if a naked call writer is assigned the underlying stock must first be purchased in the market before it can be sold to the call option buyer because call option buyers will only exercise if the, the price of the stock is above the strike price assigned naked call writers must buy the stock at one price the market price and sell at a lower price the strike price however naked call writers hope that this loss is less than the premium they originally received so that the overall result for this strategy is a profit the maximum loss that a naked call writer can face is theoretically unlimited because there is no limit to how high the price of the underlying stock can rise example refer to table 10.4 for figures presented in the following strategy a strategy covered call writing assume that an investor purchases 1000 shares of xyz at 40 dollar per share she buys 10 xyz september 50 call options at the current price of 4.55 she receives a premium of 4550 dollar calculated as four dollar fifty five cents times one hundred shares times ten contracts to take on the obligation of selling one thousand shares of xyz inc at fifty dollar per share on or before the expiration date in september because the options are in the money or the strike price is less than the stock price the four point fifty five dollar premium consists of both intrinsic value and time value intrinsic value is equal to 2.5 dollar and the time value is equal to 2.05 dollar because the investor owns shares of xyz the overall position is known as covered call and the investor is the covered call writer if at expiration in september the options are in the money or the price of xyz stock is greater than 50 dollar the covered call writer will be assigned and will have to sell the stock to the call buyer at 50 dollar per share from the covered call writer's perspective however the effective sale price is 54.55 because of the initial premium of four dollar and 55 cents overall the total profit on this position is 14 point 55 per share because the investor bought xyz at 40 dollar sold it for 50 and made 4.55 dollar from the premium if however the price of the stock at expiration in september is less than 50 dollar the covered call writer will not be assigned and the position will expire worthless call buyers will not elect to buy the stock at $50 when it can be purchased for less in the market. The covered call writer will retain the shares and the initial premium. In this case, the premium reduces the covered call writer's effective stock purchase price by $4.55 per share. Because the covered call writer bought the XYZ stock at $40, and the option expired worthless the covered call writer's effective purchase price is now 35.45 dollar calculated as 40 dollar minus 4.55 dollar therefore writing the call slightly reduces the risk of the owning the stock a strategy naked call writing assume that a different investor writes 10 xyz september 50 call options at the current price of 4.55 dollar this investor does not already own the shares so he is considered a naked call writer the naked call writer hope is that the price of xyz stock will be lower than 50 dollar at expression if this happens the call will expire worthless 
and the naked call writer will earn a profit of equal to $4.55 per share, which is the initial premium received. This premium is the most that the call writer can expect to earn from this strategy. If the price of the share increases, the naked call writer will realize a loss if the stock price is higher than the strike price plus the premium received. In this case, 54.55. If this happens, the naked call writer will be forced to buy the stock at the higher market price and then turn around and sell the shares to the call buyers at the $50 strike price. When the stock price is greater than $54.55, the cost of buying the stock is greater than the combined proceeds from selling the stock and premium initially received. For example, if the price of XYZ rises to $60 at the expiration, the naked call writer will suffer a $10 loss on the purchase and sales of the shares, which is buy at $60, sell at $50. This loss is offset somewhat by the initial premium received of $4.55 so that the actual loss is $5.45 per share or $5,450 in total, calculated as $5.45 times 100 shares times 10 contracts. Buying put options. A popular reason for buying put option is to profit from an expected decline in the price of the stock. This speculative strategy relies on the fact that put option prices tend to rise as the price of the stock falls. Just like buying calls, the selection of an expiration date and the strike price is crucial to the success or lack thereof and the strategy. Puts are also bought for risk management purpose because they can be used to lock in a minimum selling price for a stock. They are popular with investors who own a stock because they can protect the investors from a decline in the price of a stock below the strike price. Example, refer to table 10.4 for figures presented in the following strategy. A strategy, buying puts to speculate. Assume that an investor buys 10 XYZ September 50 put options at the current price of $1.50. The put buyer, the investor, pays a premium of $1,500 calculated as $1.5 times 100 shares times 10 contracts to obtain the right to sell 1,000 shares of XYZ Inc. at $50 per share on or before the expiration date in September because the options are out of the money which is the strike price is less than the stock price the $1.5 premium consists entirely of time value the option has no intrinsic value the put buyer could have an opinion about the price of XYZ stock exactly opposite of the call buyer that is the put buyer might believe that the price of XYZ stock will fall and that put option on XYZ can be bought and sold for a profit. The put buyer might have no intention of actually selling 1,000 shares of XYZ stock. In fact, in this case, he probably doesn't even own 1,000 XYZ shares to sell. He only wants to speculate that the price of XYZ share will fall. If the stock price falls, the XYZ September 50 put options will likely rise in value which will allow the put buyer to sell his options for a profit of course if the stock price rises the put option will most likely lose value and the put buyer may be forced to sell the options at loss for example if xyz stock is trading at 45 dollar one month before the september expiration date the XYZ September 50 puts will be trading for at least their intrinsic value or $5. Because there is still one month before the expiration date, the options will have some time value as well. Assuming that they have time value of $0.25, cents, the option will trade at $5.25. Therefore, 
the put buyer could choose to sell the puts for $5.25 and realize a profit of $3.75 per share, which is equal to the difference between the current put price and the put buyer's original purchase of $1.5. Based on 10 contracts, the put buyer's total profit is $3,750, calculated as $3.75 times 100 shares times 10 contracts. If, however, XYZ were trading at $60 per share, the XYZ September 50 put might be worth only $0.05 cents because the options are so far out of the money and because there is only one month left until the options expires, the options will not have a lot of time value. The low option price implies that the market does not expect XYZ shares to fall below $50 anytime over the next month. The put buyer would have to decide whether to sell the options at this price or hold them in the hope that the price of XYZ does fall to below $50. If the stock does fall, the price of puts will rise. The stock doesn't fall below $50, the puts will be worthless. Then they expire. If the put buyers decide to sell the options at five cents, he will incur a loss equal to $1.45 per share, which is five cents minus 1.50 cents, or just or $1,450 in total, calculated as $1.45 times 100 shares times 10 contracts. A strategy, buying puts to manage risk. Assume that a different investor buys 10 XYZ September 50 put options at the current price of $1.5, but in this case, the put buyer actually owns 1,000 shares of XYZ. In this case, the put purchase will act as an insurance against a drop in the price of the stock. Recall that the put buyers have the right to sell the stock at the strike price. Therefore, buying a put in conjunction with owning the stock, a strategy known as married put or put hedge, gives the put buyer the right to sell the stock at the strike price. If the price of the stock is below the strike price of the put when the puts expire, the put buyer will most likely exercise the put and sell the stock to the put writer. The strike price acts as a floor price for the sales of the stock. For example, if XYZ shares are trading at $45 just prior to the expiration date in September, the puts will trade very close to their intrinsic value of $5. They are in the money and there is a very little time left until the expiration date. The put buyer may choose to exercise the put and sell the stock at a $50 strike price. She has been protected from the drop in the stock price below $50, but the protection was not free. She had to pay $1.5 for the puts. But the put buyer's effective sale price is actually only $48.5, calculated as $50 minus $1.5, after deducting the cost of the puts. However, this sale price is still better than the stock $45 market price. Writing put options. Investors write put options primarily for the income they provide in the form of the premium. The income is the writers to keep no matter what happens to the price of the underlying asset or what the put buyer eventually does. Like the call writing cousins, the put writing strategies are primarily speculative in nature, but they can be used to manage risk as well. Put options writers can be classified as either covered or naked. Covered put writing, however, is not nearly as common as covered call writing because technically covered put writing combines a short put with a short position in the stock. It's a simple fact of the stock market that there are many more long positions in the stocks than there are short positions. Another put writing strategy similar to covered put writing 
is the cache secured put write. A cache secured put write involves writing a put and setting aside an amount of cash equal to the strike price. If possible, the cash should be invested in a short-term liquid money market security such as such as TBL, so that it will earn some interest. If the cash secured put writer is assigned, the cash or proceeds from the selling the treasury bills will be used to buy the stock from the exercising put buyer. Naked put writers have no position in the stock and have not specifically earmarked an amount of cash to buy the stocks. However, the naked put writer must be prepared to buy the stock so they could always have the financial resources to do so. Naked put writers hope to profit from a stock price that says the same or goes up. If this happens, the price of the put will likely decline as well and the chance of being signed will also be less. The naked put writers may then choose to buy back the options at the lower price to realize a profit. If the stock price does not rise, the put writers may be assigned and may suffer a loss, depending on how low the stock price is and the amount of premium received. Naked put writers may still profit even if they are assigned. The maximum loss that the naked put writer may face is limited because the price of the underlying stock can fall to a price no lower than zero. The loss would be offset somewhat by the premium received for writing the call. Although this situation is favorable compared to the unlimited risk faced by the naked call writer, it is still substantial risk to consider. Example. A strategy cash secure put writing. Assume that an investor writes 5XYZ December 55 put options at the current price of $4.85. The put writer receives a premium of $2,425 calculated as $4.85 times 100 shares times 5 contracts. To take on the obligation of buying 500 shares of F XYZ Inc. at $55 a share on or before the expiration date in December. Because the options are in the money, which is the strike price is greater than the strike price, the $4.85 premium consists of both intrinsic value and time value. Intrinsic value is equal to $2.5 and time value is equal to $2.35. If the put writer has an amount of cash equal to the purchase value of the stock set aside, the strategy is a cash secured put write. The put writer in this case would have to set aside $27,500 calculated as $55 strike price times 100 shares times 5 contracts. Some investors actually use cash secured put rights as a way to buy the stock at an effective price that is lower than the secured market price. The effective price is equal to the strike price minus the premium received. For example, if at expiration in December the price of XYZ stock is less than $55, the put writer will be assigned and will have to buy 500 shares of XYZ at the strike price of $55 per share. The effective purchase price is actually $50.15 because the put writer received a premium of $4.85 when the options were written. This price is less than $52.50 price of the stock when the cash secured put rights was established. If at expression in December the price of XYZ stock is greater than $55, the cash secured put writer will not be assigned because the options are out of the money. However, he gets to keep the premium of $4.85 and will have to decide whether to use the cash to buy the stock at the market price. A strategy, naked put writing. Assume that the difference 
investors write 5 xyz december 55 put option at the current price of 4.85 dollar the put writer does not have a short position in 500 shares of xyz or set aside a specific amount of cash to cover the potential purchase of the stock so she is considered a naked put writer the naked put writer wants the price of xyz to be higher than 55 dollar at the expiration if this happens the put will expire worthless and the writer will earn a profit equal to 4.85 dollar the initial premium if the price of xyz stock falls however the naked put writer will most likely realize a loss because put buyers will exercise their options to sell the stock at the higher price. In this case, she will suffer a loss only if XYZ stock is trading for less than $50.15 at option expression. The naked put writer will have to buy a stock at a price that is higher than the marketplace if she does not want to hold the shares in an expression of a higher price she can sell them for example if the price of xyz falls to 45 dollar at the expression the naked put writer will suffer a 10 dollar loss on the purchase and sales of the shares which is buy at the strike price of 35 $55 sell at the market price of $45. This loss is offset somewhat by the initial premium of $4.85 so that the actual loss is $5.15 a share or $2,575 in total calculated as $5.15 times 100 shares times 5 contracts. Option strategies for corporations. Unlike individual and institutional investors, corporations do not normally speculate with derivatives because they do not want to risk their shareholders' money betting on price of an underlying asset. They are, however, interested in managing risk and they often use options to do so. The risks that corporations most often manage are related to interest rate, exchange rate, or commodity prices. For example, corporations regularly take on debt to help finance their operations. Sometimes the interest rate on the debt is a floating rate that rises and falls with market interest rate. Just like the investor who buys a call to establish a maximum purchase price for a stock, corporation can buy a call to establish a maximum interest rate on a floating rate debt. Example, strategy corporate call option purchase. Assume that the Canadian company knows that it will buy one million US dollar worth of goods from a US supplier in three months time based on an exchange rate of 1.32 Canadian dollar per US dollar the US dollar purchase will cost the company 1.32 million Canadian dollar the company can do two things to secure the one million US dollar buy it now and pay 1.32 million canadian dollars or wait three months and pay whatever the exchange rate is at that time the company would prefer to wait but by doing so it faces the risk that the value of the u.s dollar will strengthen relative to the canadian dollar the canadian dollar cost of the purchase in such a scenario would be higher than 1.32 million Canadian dollar. To protect itself against this risk, the corporation buys a three months US dollar call option with a strike price of $1.35. This option can be bought at the Montreal Exchange or in the OTC market. If at the end of three months the exchange rate turns out to be 1.40 Canadian dollar the corporation will exercise the call and buy the US dollar for 1.35 Canadian dollar if however the US dollar weakens so that in three months the exchange rate is 1.30 Canadian dollar the corporation will let the option expire and buy the US dollar at the lower exchange rate 
the purchase of the call option has capped the exchange rate at 1.35 plus the cost of the option strategy corporate put option purchase assume that the canadian oil company will have 1 million barrels of crude oil to sell in six months time the current price of crude oil is 40 dollar 40 us dollar per barrel but the company is not sure what the price will be in six months to lock in a minimum sales price the company buys a put option on 1 million barrel of crude oil with a strike price of 38 dollar per barrel this will protect the company from an oil price lower than 38 dollar per barrel if in six months the price of crude oil is less than 38 us dollar the company will exercise its put option and sell the oil to the put option writer at the strike price if the price is greater than 38 us dollar the company will let the option expire and will sell the oil at the going market price forwards and futures learning objective five distinguish between forwards and futures contract and the strategies used by market participants a forward is a contract between two parties, a buyer and a seller. The buyer of a forward agrees to buy the underlying asset from the seller on a future date at a price agreed on today. Unlike options agreements, both parties are obliged to participate in the future trade. Forwards can trade on an exchange or OTC market. When a forward is traded on an exchange, it is called a future contract. Futures are usually classified into two groups depending on the type of the underlying asset. Financial futures are contracts with a financial asset as the underlying asset. Commonly, underlying assets include stocks, bond, currencies, interest rate, stock indexes. Commodity futures are contracts with a physical asset as the underlying asset. Commonly, underlying assets include precious and base metals, crude oil and natural gas, grains and oil seeds, meats and dairy, lumber. When a forward is traded over the counter, it is generally referred as a forward agreement. The predominant types of forward agreements are based on the interest rate and currencies. Key terms and definitions. Futures are simply exchange traded forward contracts. As such, they have many of the features inherent to the forward contracts. They are agreements between two parties to buy or sell an underlying asset at the future time at a predetermined price. The party that agrees to buy the underlying asset holds a long position in the future contract. This party is also said to have bought the future contracts. The party that agrees to sell the underlying asset holds the short position in the contract and is said to have sold the future contract. The buyer of a future contract does not pay anything to the seller when the two parties into the contract. Likewise, the seller does not deliver the underlying asset right away. The future contract simply establishes the price at which a trade will take place in the future. As it turns out, most parties end up offsetting their position prior to expression so that few deliveries actually take place. If a contract is not offset and is held to the expiration date, the seller is obliged to deliver the underlying asset and accept payment from the buyer. Likewise, the buyer is obliged to accept deliveries of the underlying asset and take payment to the seller. Like all exchange traded derivatives, futures are standardized with respect to the amount of the asset underlying each contract, expression dates and delivery locations. The standardization allows users to offset their contracts prior to expiration and provides the backing of a clearing house. Cash settled features. Many financial futures are based on underlying assets that are difficult or even impossible to deliver. For these types of futures, delivery involves an exchange of cash from one party to the other. The amount is based on the performance of the underlying asset from the time that the futures was entered into until the time that it expires. These futures are known as cash settled futures contracts. 
An equity index future contract is an example of a cash settled future contract. Parties holding long position in a stock index futures contract are not obliged to accept delivery of the stocks that make up the index. Likewise, those who are short are not required to deliver the stocks. Instead, if the position is held to the expiration date, not either the long or the short will make a cash payment to the other based on the difference between the price agreed to in the futures contract and the price of the underlying asset on the expiration date. If the price agreed to in the future contract is greater than the price of the underlying asset at expiration, price have fallen and the long must pay the short. If the price agreed to in the futures contract is less than the price of the underlying asset at expiration, prices have risen and the short must pay the long. As with all other future contracts, cash settled futures can be offset prior to expiration. Margin requirements and marking to market. Buyers and sellers of future contracts must deposit and maintain adequate margins in their future accounts. Future margins are meant to provide a level of assurance that the financial obligations of the contract will be met. In effect, futures margins represent a good faith deposit or performance bond. Two level of margins are used in future trading. Initial margin, also called original margin, and the maintenance margin. Initial margin is required when the contract is entered into. Maintenance margin is re minimum account balance that must be maintained while the contract is still open. Minimum initial and maintenance margin rates for a particular future contracts are set by the exchange on which it trades. Investment dealers may impose higher rates on their clients, but they may not charge less than the exchange minimum. One of the important features of future trading is daily settlement of gains and losses. This process is known as marking to market. At the end of each trading day, those holding long position in contract make a payment to those who are short or vice versa, depending on the change in the price of the contract from the previous day. If either party accumulates losses that cause their account balance to fall below the maintenance margin level, they must deposit additional margin into the futures account. Example, Greg buys a future contract and Layla sells the same future contract on the same day. The initial margin required in each account is $2,000 and the maintenance margin is $1,500. Both Greg and Layla put up the initial margin required. The first day, the futures gain $200. At the end of the day, Greg's account is credited $200 and Layla's is debited $200. Greg's account now shows a balance of $2,200 and Layla's account shows a balance of $1,800. On the second day, the future drops $300. At the end of the day, Greg is debited $300 and Layla is credited $300. Greg's account now shows a balance of $1,900 and Layla's account shows a balance of $2,100. As you can see, Greg and Layla's accounts are debited and credited each day by the amount of the gain or loss on the futures contract until they offset or close their positions. When the futures drop another $500 on the third day, Greg's account is debited $500. It now shows a balance of $1,400, which is below the maintenance margin. Greg's dealer sent him a margin call, and Greg must deposit $600 so that the account is back to the initial margin. This is how initial and maintenance margin and marking to market works. Future trading and leverage. Future margin requirement are typically 3% to 10% of a contract's value. In contrast, investors can buy or sell equities with margin deposits ranging from 30 to 80%. For example, a $10,000 loan position in a security eligible for reduced margin can be arranged with a $3,000 deposit. The same $3,000 deposit, however, could secure a future position with a value of $100,000. 
with such a small percentage of contracts value required to trade future contracts become highly leveraged so it is possible to lose more than the amount of money initially deposited although leverage is often associated with future trading it should be noted that it is not inherent in future contracts a future trader could decide to deposit a contract's full value as margin rather than the minimum margin required for example a trader that goes long in a gold future contract could deposit the contract's value of 120,000 US dollar or 10 troy ounces at an assumed price of 1,200 US dollar per ounce as margin. In this scenario, the trade is not leveraged at all. Future exchanges. The Montreal Exchange lists financial futures. It offers contracts on index futures two years, five-year and ten-year government of canada bonds bankers acceptance and 30-day overnight repo rate future strategies for investors futures are inherently simpler than options with options there are four basic positions long a call short a call long a put or short a put future contracts have only two basic positions long and short Options also have a strike price so that an almost unaccountable number of different strategies can be designed by combining options with different strike prices and expiration dates, as well as with a position in the underlying asset. The number of strategies that can be designed with futures is limited because there are only two basic positions for each expiration date. Buying Futures Investors buy futures either to profit from an expected increase in the price of the underlying asset or to lock in a purchase price for the asset on some future dates. The former application is a speculative strategy, whereas the latter is one of risk management. Buying futures to speculate Buying a future contract to profit from the expectation of rising prices is a speculative strategy. The investor probably has no intention to actually buying the underlying asset. Rather, the investor wants to sell the futures contract at a higher price than what was originally paid. The chances of this happening depends primarily on the changes in the price of the underlying asset in the spot or cash market. If the spot price of the underlying asset rises, then the price of the futures contract will also rise. Of course, the investors face the risk and the price of the underlying asset will fall. If this happens, the price of the futures contract will fall as well, and the investor may be forced to sell the contract at a loss. Buying futures to manage risk. Buying a futures contract to lock in a purchase price is a risk management strategy. In this case, the investor does not offset a contract. At expression, the investor takes the delivery of the underlying asset for the amount agreed upon when the contract was originally bought. The purchase of the future contract locks the investors in a predetermined purchase price of the underlying asset regardless of what happens to the price of the underlying in the spot market selling futures investors sells futures for the same reason that they buy them either to profit from an expected decline in the price of the underlying asset or to lock in a sales price for the asset on some future date selling futures to a speculate Selling a future contract simply to profit from an expectation of lower price is a speculative strategy. The investor probably has no intention of actually selling the underlying asset. Rather, he or she wants to buy back the futures in the market at a lower price than what the contract originally sold for. The chances of this happening depends primarily on the change in the price of the underlying asset in the spot or cash market. If the price of the underlying asset falls in the cash market, then the price of the future contract also falls, and the investor realizes a profit in offsetting the future contract at a lower price. Of course, the investor faces the risk that the underlying prices will rise. If this happens, the price of the future contract will rise 
as well and the investor may be forced to buy back the contract at a loss. Selling futures to manage risk. Selling a future contract to lock in a selling price is a risk management strategy. In this case, the investor does not offset the contract. At expiration, he or she will be required to sell the underlying asset for the agreed amount when the contract was originally sold. The sales of the future contract locks the investors into predetermined selling price, regardless of what happens to the price of the underlying asset in the spot market. Futures strategies for corporations. Corporations use futures to manage risk in the same way that investors do. When the company needs to lock in the purchase price of an asset, it may decide to buy futures on the asset. Similarly, when the company needs to lock in the sales price of an asset, it may decide to sell futures on the asset. Even though they take futures position consistent with their risk management needs, the companies usually offset their position before expiration, rather than actually making or taking delivery of the underlying asset. However, the futures can still satisfy a company's risk management needs by providing price protection. Example, in July, a brewery determines that it will need 100 tons of barley in October. Barley is trading in the spot market at $150 a ton. And October barley futures are trading at $155 a ton. The brewery's regular barley supplier will not guarantee a fixed price for the October purchase, but instead will charge the spot price on the day that the brewery placed the order. To protect itself from the sharp increase in the price of barley, the brewery buys five October barley futures at the current price of $155. Each barley futures contract has an underlying asset of 20 tons of barley. In early October, the barley is trading at $170 per ton in the spot market. At the same time, October barley futures are trading at $171 per ton, rather than taking delivery by holding its future position until the expiration date, the brewery would like to buy the barley from its regular supplier. There are three reasons why the brewery might want to deal with its regular supplier. The brewery's operation may be located far from the standardized delivery location for barley futures. If the brewery were to take delivery of the barley, it would incur the expense of shipping the barley from the delivery location to its own location. The exact quality of the barley that underlies the barley futures contract may not match the quality of the brewery normally used. The brewery's regular supplier would presumably be able to deliver the required quality. The standardized delivery date of the barley futures contract may not coincide with the exact date that the brewery requires the delivery. Again, the regular supplier would likely be able to deliver on the date the brewery required. To get out of its obligation to buy barley by way of futures contract, the brewery offset its position by selling five October barley futures at the price of $171 per ton. Because the price has risen and the brewery had a long position, it earns a profit of $16 per ton on the future transactions. At the same time, the brewery places an order to buy 100 tons of barley from its supplier. The supplier charges the brewery the current spot price of $170 per ton. The brewery's effective price, however, is lower because of the future profits. The net effect is that the brewery ends up paying $154 per ton, which is equal to the $170 purchase price minus the $16 future profits. So even though barley rose $20 from late July to early October, the price the brewery actually pays is only $4 higher than the price back in July. The futures contract provided the brewery with price protection for the majority of the price increase. This process illustrates how companies use futures for price protection rather than an outlet to buy or sell underlying assets. Rights and warrants. 
Learning Objective 6. Distinguish between the features, benefit, and intrinsic value of rights and warrants. Like call options on stocks, rights and warrants are securities that give their owners the right but not the obligation to buy a specific amount of a stock at a specific price on or before the expiration date. Unlike options, however, rights and warrants are usually issued by a company as methods of raising capital. Although they may dilute the position of existing shareholders, if they are exercised, they allow the company to raise capital quickly and cost effectively. The other major difference between rights, warrants, and call options is the time to expiration. Rights are usually very short term, with an expiration date often as little as four to six weeks after they are issued. Warrants tends to be issued with three to five years to expiration. Rights. A right is a privilege granted to an existing shareholder to acquire additional shares directly from the issuing company. There is no cost for shareholder to acquire these rights. To raise capital by issuing additional common shares, a company may give shareholders right that allow them to buy additional shares in direct proportion to the number of shares they already own. For example, shareholders may be given one right for each share they own and the offer may be based on the right to buy one additional share for each 10 shares held. In other words, the company may want to increase its outstanding shares by 10%, so shareholders are given the opportunity to increase their own holding by 10%. The exercise price of a right, known as the subscription price or offering price, is the price shareholder pay to purchase the additional shares of the company. The offering price is almost always lower than the market price of the shares at the time that the rights are issued. This discount makes a right valuable and gives shareholder an incentive to exercise them. When a company decides to do a rights offering, they announce a record date to determine the list of shareholders who will receive the rights, much as they do when they issue a dividend. All common shareholders who are in the record book on the record date receive rights. On the business day before the record date, the share trade X rights. This means that anyone buying shares on or after the X right date is not entitled to receive the rights from the company. Between the date of the announcement that rights will be issued and X right date, the stock is says to be trading come rights. This term means that anyone who buys the stock is entitled to receive the rights if they own the stock until at least the record date. The usual method of making an offering is to use one right for each outstanding common shares. A certain number of these rights are required to buy one new share. In addition to having the correct number of rights required purchase share, the subscriber must pay the subscription price to the company to acquire those additional shares. No commission is levied when the rights holder exercises the right and acquire shares. The rights are usually listed on the exchange that lists the underlying common stock. The price of the rights tends to rise and fall in the secondary market as price of the common stock fluctuates, although not necessarily to the same degree. A right holder may take one of the following courses of actions. Exercise some or all of the rights and acquire the shares. Sell some or all of the rights. Buy additional rights to trade or exercise later. Do nothing and let the rights expire worthless. Doing nothing provides no benefit. Rights are not automatically exercised on behalf of their holders. The holders must select a course of action appropriate for his or her circumstances. Intrinsic value of rights. Like options, rights may have intrinsic value. As mentioned previously, rights are normally issued with the subscription price lower than the market price of the stock. This means that the, they have intrinsic value at the time that they are issued. After they are issued, they will have intrinsic value as long as the market price of the stock stays above the subscription price.
because writes have a short lifespan they generally have very little time value although they do have some as with options the trading price of a write equals to the intrinsic value if any plus the time value two formulas are used to calculate the intrinsic value of a write one is used during x write period the other used during the come write period the intrinsic value of rights during the x write period on the business day before the record dates the shares start trading x write and the rights begin to trade as a separate entity the intrinsic value of a write during the x write period is calculated using the formula in figure 10.1 Figure 10.1 Intrinsic value of rights during the X right period. Intrinsic value of rights equals to S minus X divided by N. S equals the market price of the stock. X equals the exercise or subscription price of the rights. And N equals the number of rights needed to buy one shares. Example. On June 1st, ABC Co. declares the following right offering. Shareholders of record on Friday, June 10 will be granted one right for each common share held. Five rights are required to buy one new share at a subscription price of $23. The rights will expire at the close of business on July 6. On June 9, the first day of the X right period, the rights begin to trade as a separate security if on this day ABC shares open for trading at $25, the intrinsic value of each right is $0.4, calculated as follow. Intrinsic value of right equals to $25 minus $23 divided by 5 equals to $2 divided by 5 equals to 40 cents. The intrinsic value of rights during the come right period. A different formula is needed to calculate the intrinsic value of a right during the come right period because during this time the rights are embedded in the common stock. Because buyers of the stock during the come right period are eligible to receive the rights a portion of the com stocks price represent the value of the rights as well as the value of the stock the formula for the intrinsic value of the rights during the com right period must take into account the fact that each abc shares includes one right adding one to the denominator in the com rights formula takes into account that a right is Included in the price of a share during the combine period, as shown below. Intrinsic value of right equals to S minus X divided by N plus 1. Example. On June 1st, ABC Code declares the following rights offering. Shareholders of records on Friday, June 10, will be granted one right for each common share held. Five rights are required to buy one new share at a subscription price of $23. The rights will expire at the close of business on July 6. On June 3, during the come rights period, the rights have not yet begun to trade as a separate security. If on this day, ABC shares opened for trading at $25.60, the intrinsic value of each right is 43 cents calculated as follow intrinsic value of right equals $25.60 minus $23 divided by 6 equals to $2.6 divided by 6 equals to 43 cents trading rights if the common shares of the company issuing rights are listed on a stock exchange the rights are listed on the exchange automatically trading in the rights take place until they expire the term is stock exchange or tsx and tsx venture exchange terminate trading in the rights at noon on the expiry date canadian trading practice requires that the rights transaction be settled by the second business day after the transaction take place this process is known as a regular delivery 
A and E is identical to the settlement period of a stock. Did you know, as expiry approaches, the rules that govern settlement typically change. The rules may vary from the exchange to exchange, so it is best to consult the rule book of the relevant exchange to determine the rules that are currently in practice. Warrants a warrant is a security that gives its holder the right to buy shares in a company from the issuer at a set price for a set period of time. In this sense, the warrants are similar to call options. The primary difference between the two is that warrants are issued by the company itself, whereas call options are issued or written by other investors. Warrants are often issued as part of a package that also contains a new debt or preferred share issues. The warrants help make these issues more attractive to buyers by giving them the opportunity to participate in any appreciation of the issuer's common shares. In other words, they function like and are known as sweeteners. <coughs> Once issued, warrants can be sold either immediately or after a certain holding period. The expiration date of warrants, which can extend to several years from the date of the issue, is longer than that of a wrap. Valuing warrants. Like options, warrants may have both intrinsic value and time value. Intrinsic value is the amount by which the market price of the underlying common stock exceeds the exercise price of the warrant. A warrant has no intrinsic value. If the market price of the common stock is less than the exercise price, time value is the amount by which the market price of the warrant exceeds the intrinsic value. For example, a warrant to buy one common share at $40 has no intrinsic value when the price of the common stock is $30. However, it will still have a market value of several dollars because even with no intrinsic value, the market will attach a time value to the warrant. The greater the time remaining to expiration, the longer the period will be during which the underlying common stock may increase in price. The market speculates on this possibility and attaches a value to it, hence the term time value. As the expiration date approaches, there is less time for the common stock to increase in the value, so time value falls. When it expires, an unexercised warrants is worthless. Why investors buy warrants? The main attraction of warrants is their leverage potential. The market price of a warrant is usually much lower than the price of the underlying security and generally moves in the same direction at the same time as the price of the underlying. Therefore, the capital appreciation of a warrant on a percentage basis can greatly exceed that of the underlying security. Example, Louis, an investor, buys a warrant. Beatrice and other investors buy the underlying common stock. The warrant has the following information. Market value, $4.00. Exercise price $12. Market price of the underlying common stock $15. This one has an intrinsic value of $3 and a time value of $1 calculated as follow. Intrinsic value is the market price of the underlying minus the exercise price equals to $15 minus $12 equals to $3. Time value is the market value minus intrinsic value. That is $4 minus $3 equals to $1. If the common stock rises to $23 per share before the warrant expires, for example, the results are as follows. For the warrant buyer, the price will rise from $4 to $11 for a 175% return over the original market value. The warrants would rise to at least the intrinsic value. For the common stock buyer, the profit would be $8, calculated as $23 minus $15, for a 53% return over the original market price. Of course, the reverse is also true. Instead of Rising from $15 to $23, the stock may decline from $15 to 
a decline in the price of the common stock from 15 to 10 dollar will result in a 33 percent loss for the shareholder whereas if the warrant falls from four dollar to 25 cents no intrinsic value but still a small amount of time value the buyer will face a 94 percent loss summary in this chapter we discuss the following key aspect of derivative a derivative is a financial contract between a buyer and a seller it, its value is derived from the value of an underlying asset which can be a commodity a financial asset an index a currency or an interest rate otc derivatives are customizable whereas exchange traded derivatives are standardized contracts an option contract grants the buyer the right to buy or sell the underlying asset by a certain date and imposes an obligation on the seller to complete the transaction if called upon to do so. A forward contract imposes trading obligation on both the buyer and the seller at a price agreed upon when they enter into the contract. The four types of participant in derivative includes individual investors, institutional investors, businesses and corporations, and derivative dealers. Investors, institutions, and businesses use derivatives either to speculate or to hedge risk. Dealers buy and sell derivatives to meet the demands of the end users. An option that gives its owner the right to buy the underlying asset is, is a call option. One that gives the right to sell the underlying asset is a put option. Investors buy call options to block in a price for a future purchase or to speculate on a future rise in the price. They sell call options to generate income. An exchange traded forward contract which is standardized and regulated is called a future contract. Investor buy futures either to profit from an increase in the price of the underlying asset to lock in the purchase price. They sell futures either to profit from an expected decline in the price of the underlying asset to lock in the sales price. A right is a free privilege granted to a shareholder by an issuing company to acquire additional shares in a direct proportion to the number of shares already owned. A warrant is a security that gives its holder the right to buy shares in a company from the issuer at a set price until expiration. Okay, and uh, this is end of chapter 10, derivatives. Thanks for listening so far. Uh, see you in next chapter.